Hello, I'm back, and now we're looking at a critique of classical or traditional utilitarianism, and then also introducing negative utilitarianism by way of uh, Sir Karl Popper. So let's review a basic definition, our basic definition of utilitarianism as an ethical theory to be that one must always act so as to produce the greatest aggregate or amount of happiness among all or most sentient beings or all people. Okay, so then now we'll turn to the uh, last points of the McKinnon and Fiala chapter that and then segue into Karl Popper's negative utilitarianism. So the chapter on utilitarianism, we'll just look at some of the last parts of it and then uh, move on to how we're understanding uh, Karl Popper's negative utilitarianism. Okay, so. On page 102 of chapter 5, we have the subchapter uh, titled Ends and Means. So once we have this principle at the forefront of our understanding, we must adhere. In, in other words, once we have this principle of utilitarianism, so let me read it again. One must always act so as to produce the greatest aggregate um, or amount of happiness among all or most sentient beings or all people. Once we have this as the forefront of, at the forefront of our understanding, we must adhere to this idea of consequentialism. That in other words, utilitarianism is consequentialist, whereby a cursory glance or even a flippant criticism would uh, word this as the ends justify the means. So one might think this is a philosophy whereby the ends justify the means as a way to critique uh, utilitarianism. So recall that the um, uh, mo uh, motives don't matter as much as the consequences of happiness procured for the utilitarian, right? So the happiness for the most amount of people uh, has, has to do with the uh, sentient uh, beings that are satisfied, but yet the ends justify the means, uh, then points to a criticism of utilitarianism. Uh, the principle whereby those who fall outside of this majority uh, that are benefited by the consequences, who are made happy by a particular circumstance slash consequence. Um, so, so in other words, this is a criticism of such a uh, an end result, right? So if the ends justify the means, we're led to wonder about this idea that the majority benefits uh, in the sense that the majority is the, are those who are made happy uh, as a consequence. And so uh, if we as utilitarians favor maximizing the happiness for most, there's always a percentage of people who are left outside of the majority, okay? So that's a critique of utilitarianism presented as uh, oftentimes as the so-called trolley problem, whereby if one were to have a choice, a utilitarian would um, choose to hold a lever that will allow either the inevitable death of one person on a track that was about to be hit by a trolley or to let the trolley hit five people. So the utilitarian in this uh, thought experiment will see this as a majority rules decision to route the train to hit the one person, you know, uh, pull the lever to route the train to hit the one person and the, um, and the five that are left are happy, okay, quote unquote. So the obvious critique then, so this is a critique of utilitarianism, is that we still have the moral concern for anyone who is harmed, right? Even if it is just one person in the name of saving five people. So in other words, 
a natural law ethicist, so a natural law ethicist would see this um, either uh, see this uh, rerouting of the trolley as inherently immoral. So the rerouting of the trolley, trolley thought experiment would be thought of by a natural law theorist, ethicist, to be inherently moral based on our int the intrinsic value we place uh, on individuals um, as well as a group. Um, in fact, all persons are worthy of uh, respect, right? So non-consequentially. So in other words, Virtue ethicists and natural law uh, theorists, deontologists, are non-consequential, and th the morality there is based on the intrinsic worth of the person on principle. Okay, so for a utilitarian, such a critique is uh, manifested in a majority rules mindset. Right, so that's one way we could look at this as ut at utilitarianism critically. So that leads to problems in environmental policy, given that the majority values economic well-being above and beyond environmental well-being, right? So likewise with social policy and also social justice. So where a majority view, val where a majority uh, values the view of one demographic over another who is in the minority. Okay, so, so in other words, a utilitarian uh, social policy favors the majority over the minority. And so this is a problematic critique, or this is a critique of utilitarianism. So this likewise presents an obvious disparity um, uh, between uh, a disparity and injustice that then is, is palpable, right? So although the tro trolley problem is not necessarily connected to negative utilitarianism, okay, uh, so the trolley critique is not necessarily connected to negative utilitarianism. Negative utilitarianism is a critique of classical or traditional uh, utilitarianism. So this is where we turn to our online link that I have you look at, whereby uh, Karl Popper, who was an Austrian-British philosopher of science, interestingly enough, um, who was alive in the 20th century, born in 1902 and died in 1994, so he was fairly recent. Uh, Popper was skeptical of uh, totalitarian tribalism, whereby the group is favored above the individual, um, above, the, above individuals, right? So authoritarians uh, and totalitarians aim for a tribalism in, in closed societies, right, that he was critical of. In these closed societies, a totalitarian or an authoritarian favors a type of tribalism that is usually uh, sought after in the name of nationalism and the like. Okay, so such societies are formed at, uh, in his reference point as closed societies. So he's advocating for an open society, right? So for him, a closed society in this case is a society that favors majority rule, right? And those who fall outside of the major majority are less important, or in this case, there's the obvious reference to po the problems of genocide in the 20th century, the Holocaust, totalitarianism, uh, and its uh, authoritarian ideologies, etc., that Karl Popper lived through in uh, Europe of the 20th century, right? So uh, we find the quote of Popper's from his 1952 book, The Open Society and Its Enemies. And I've looked at this, and, and what's funny about this quote is it's actually this obscure it's actually this obscure footnote, um, but interestingly enough, it's, it's really the sort of um, beginning point of what we're terming negative uh, utilitarianism. So 
This is from his book from 1952, The Open Society and Its Enemies. So Popper writes, quote, I believe there is, from an ethical point of view, no symmetry between suffering and happiness or between pain and pleasure. Both the greatest happiness principle of the utilitarians and Kant's principle promote other people's happiness seem to me, at least, in their formulations, fundamentally wrong in this point, which is, however, not one for rational argument. In my opinion, in Karl Popper's opinion, human suffering makes a direct moral appeal for help. While there is no similar call to increase the happiness of a man who's doing well anyway. So let me read that again. So in my opinion, in Karl Popper's opinion, human suffering makes a direct moral appeal for help, while there's no similar call to increase the happiness of a man who is doing well anyway, unquote. Okay, so Let's draw a focus to Popper's line the first sen- in the first sentence that he believes there's no symmetry between suffering and happiness or between pain and pleasure. So in other words, we'll, we'll uh, first define negative utilitarianism as akin to classical utilitarianism with Bentham and Mill as something like this. So, quote, one must always act so as to decrease the greatest aggregate of suffering for the most amount of people and or sentient beings, unquote. And so I'm quoting myself there, okay? So often when uh, uh, students hear this formulation of Popper's negative utilitari- of negative utilitarianism, we uh, are left to assume that to increase happiness is symmetrical uh, with a decrease in suffering. So that to decrease suffering is synonymous with increasing happiness. So we often think this, okay? So the critique rests on the principle that the two are not synonymous, okay? Yet, at the same time, we must always distinguish that they're not the opposite then. Okay, so they're not the opposite of each each other, a conclusion we're tempted to make. So both negative and classical utilitarians or traditional utilitarians aim for the good and for good consequences, okay? So again, if we show that an authoritarian regime, show that in in an authoritarian regime, we're inclined to favor a majority's aim toward goodness and happiness without as much concern for a decrease in suffering. Really is the the critique of utilitarianism, okay? So to aim to decrease suffering is not exactly the same then, okay? So our recent Black Lives Matter protests are aimed at the decrease of suffering of black men in the hands of white police officers, right? Okay, so likewise, from an environmentally ethical standpoint, Uh, We also have a negative utilitarian view toward animal rights, right? So, and also our dietary needs. So, whereby we'd aim to reduce the suffering of animals, that's not to be confused with an increase of happiness for animals, okay? So, in other words, We really should just be aiming at decreasing the suffering of animals rather than going for something that seems a bit more unrealistic to advocate for the happiness of animals, right? So to aim for a decrease in suffering then seems to cover more ground, so to speak. We take care of more. We take care of more people, and likewise, we're also taking care of animals, right? Because we're concerned with decreasing suffering, right? So, whereby an an insistence on the achievement of happiness for the utilitarian easily distracts the classical utilitarian away from the importance of suffering and pain. So, both 
one, um, uh, so both are affective and emotional. So enough to get us to recognize our own conscientious appeal for empathy. And so our appeal for, our conscientious appeal for empathy for the pain of others and the suffering of others and the pain and suffering of animals. Likewise, the pain and suffering that are felt in an environment, indeed a polluted environment, right? So the insistence on pleasure and happiness, the critique then is that in the insistence on a um, pleasure or happiness for a utilitarian draws us to a kind of utopianism of a world that's devoid of necessary suffering. So we might be aiming for uh, uh, getting rid of suffering completely, right? And that's not possible. So as we know, there are parallels with negative utilitarianism and Buddhist recognition, right? So a Buddhist recognition of suffering as something to take for granted. So remember that suffering for a Buddhist is something that we in fact can take for granted, okay? So in uh, 20th century philosophy, we have one of the leaders of the Frankfurt School, uh, T.W. Adorno. He has a famous quote that it's well, he's well known for pointing out that to lend a voice to suffering is a condition for all truth. So, quote, to lend a voice to suffering is a condition for all truth, unquote. So I'll leave you with that and talk to you later.